I just on suspicion I of murder. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention when questioned something which you later rely on in court. Anything you do say may be given evidence. The necessity for your arrest is for a prompt and effective investigation. Frankie Fitzgerald just happened to be in the wrong relationship at the wrong time. This is his story. Hey guys, welcome back to The Raven's Room. Thank you for watching and thank you for all the new subscribers. I really appreciate it. Today's case is particularly interesting because obviously everyone watching this is gonna have a love of true crime, like me. I've actually recorded this about three times and deleted it because I just didn't like any of the previous recordings and I feel like I just didn't do it right, didn't do justice. So hopefully this one will be the one. Fourth time lucky, I've even made myself an Irish coffee to do this, so. Let me know if it's good. <laughs> Shay Groves was born in 1996. Her actual date of birth doesn't seem to be written in anything, anywhere, even court documents, I couldn't find it. Shay's childhood was particularly rough, so there was a lot of domestic abuse in the home. She suffered a lot of violence and she got beaten regularly as a child. And due to being a child, this was her way of learning. It's her way of how she coped with the world. So she would often model this in school and be violent towards classmates and get into a lot of fights. And this was happening quite early on in primary school. So that would be in between the ages of like five to 12, roughly. And on one occasion during this time period, she actually brought a scalpel into school and threatened her classmates with it. It was also in her childhood years that she began self-harming and this really isn't surprising considering she probably had absolutely no coping and tolerant skills because what she sees at home model to her, that's all she knows. That's all she knows how to cope with emotions, how to process them and understand them. So if she's a lot of things inside that she can't deal with, her outlet for that was to cut and she would in particular cut her thighs because they were much easier to hide. Shay's friends from that time would actually go on to describe her as being manipulative. So even as a young child, she was described in that way. So she would often lie and be deceitful to have her needs met. Her violent tendencies would follow her into her teenage years. So now instead of a scalpel, she would carry a knife around a lot of the time, not all the time, but a lot of the time. And I can only hazard a guess to say she must have been living in a constant flight or fright type of mind frame that she thought that she would need this to protect herself, which again, probably mirrors um, how difficult it was at home and that's probably how she felt at home. As a teenager her friends would not describe her as girly as such but she would definitely stand out and she would be unique in her style and her fashion. So at the time teenagers would all be wearing bright clothes but Shay would be wearing dark clothes. She wasn't goth but she was it was just different it was like a different style she stood out people noticed her. A lot of people also thought that she was a bit strange and again I don't think this was in a bad way it was just, she was a bit odd. She just wasn't your typical kid. So it became clear as the years passed that Shay was struggling with some issues. Now it's not clear who exactly made the referral for a mental health assessment. It may have been a teacher, I probably doubt it was her parents, but who knows, maybe it could have been a social worker, but she had a mental health assessment when she was 13 or 14. And the results of this mental health assessment actually determined that she had bipolar, but this diagnosis would later be questioned in years to come. So we're not actually sure if that was an accurate diagnosis or not. After this diagnosis of bipolar, she then turned to alcohol and drugs to kind of cope and deal with it and also to deal with her home life life and this made her spiral down even more. This ended up with her leaving home in her mid-teens, so still a baby really, and she found her way into another abusive romantic relationship. This relationship, obviously incredibly toxic, just led to Shay going further and further off the rails. This relationship did come to an end and Shay was progressing into adulthood at this point. Somehow in her teenage years, Shay managed to avoid getting any convictions whatsoever. So considering that she was quite violent and would carry around a knife most of the time, she was quite lucky. By the time she legally became an adult at 18, people would describe her as being headstrong hard to be controlled, manipulative still, and also somewhat possessive and jealous of partners. Things were looking quite bad for Shay at this point, 
But there was a little light at the end of the tunnel. When she was in her early 20s, she actually met a guy called Ashley Wingham. And Ashley Wingham, he wasn't violent and he didn't appear to be abusive like the previous relationship that she had. Shay and Ashley would actually go on to have a baby together. So in April 2017, the baby was due. But at one of the appointments before the baby was due for her kind of prenatal care, it was suggested to her that she should have another mental health assessment. So she complied, she did that. And this one actually didn't show up bipolar. It showed up that she had PTSD. And it can only be presumed the PTSD is from her childhood, from her past. So it's clear that she was quite traumatized from what she had been through up until that point. Everything was going well with Ashley until it wasn't going well. So they'd had the baby, everything went well for a while, but then the couple started to get into arguments and eventually it ended up with Shay leaving the house. And she actually went to a women's refuge, but it, it isn't stated anywhere and Shay has never said that Ashley has ever hit her or been abusive towards her. It could have been that she literally just had nowhere else to go. So a woman's refuge is what she chose. So after this breakup, it seemed that Ashley and Shay were able to co-parent together and kind of get on with things. Shay seemed to be doing quite well. All we can take from her social media posts is that from the outside, it appeared that she was doing well in kind of mum life and all of the rest of it. But, you know, just because you post some videos on Facebook or your Instagram or pictures, it doesn't really mean, it doesn't really mean Shay, like who knows what she's like behind the scenes. So some videos that will be posted up there would be of her and her daughter making cupcakes, for example. Um, and a lot of other videos and people refer to this as saying like, oh, she was such a great mom, but we don't have a clue what she was like, really. That A video like that means nothing. But what we do know is around this time, Shay started to change somewhat. So she was always a bit strange. She was always a little bit um, kind of dark and mysterious, but it seemed to kind of ramp up a bit in these years. So her daughter at this point would have been roughly two or three, and she started to become very into, very obsessed with true crime. And so obsessed that she actually put pictures behind her of like Jeffrey Dahmer, uh, Rose West, um, What's the other guy called? Um, Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy. Um, yeah, so she'd have a wall with loads of their pictures on it. And some of them would have like blood splatter on it. And um, yeah, it just it seemed a bit weird, you know, because that was all happening at the same time that are in or around the same time where she was posting up pictures of her and her daughter. So I'm kind of thinking, you know, if you're posting up pictures like that, then that's a bit messed up for it. Like a, a then what nearly toddler to see that and be exposed to that just seems a bit weird. Fair enough if you're interested in it, but just don't have it in your hallway so a child can see. Um, that's not a, you know, it's not a healthy environment by any means. And around this time, she also would become really obsessed with knives and she would actually have kind of ornamental knives like around, dotted around the house in various places. Um, and one in particular that she really liked that she said she used it in her pagan rituals was a Celtic knife. That knife is important later, so just have on to that. So around this time, Shay would actually describe herself as dark and twisted. Or maybe she fed into the fact that this was obscure and different than most people and the shock factor of it, which is what she used to say about the pictures on her wall of the serial killers that she put them up there because, you know, it liked to shock people. So maybe there was like an attention aspect to it as well as maybe a genuine interest. She would often stay up very late, consume lots of documentaries about serial killers for hours and hours. She'd have loads of books in her room about serial killers. So it was just every where she was consuming serial killing and murder and everything, true crime, all over the place. And again, there's nothing wrong with this. It's just knowing what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. If you live in a house with children, probably don't have a lot of that stuff hanging around. Keep it in somewhere where they're not gonna see it, you know? So as well as this observable change in her behaviors that you can see her interests are changing somewhat, she also started to aesthetically change, so physically change. So she began getting some more tattoos. She already had some, but she was getting more and a lot more piercings. So 
instead of pair of scenes that weren't, you know, that that um that extreme or that obvious, like you know, ear piercings or a simple lip piercing, there were multiple piercings all around her mouth and her eyebrows, and I don't know what this area is called, but in between here. So at this point, it's July 2022, and Shay is living in a place called Haven't in Hampshire in the UK. She's living with a housemate called Lauren White, who's also a friend from childhood. Now, their relationship seems really weird and not so much like a friendship. Other friends would actually say of their friendship that Lauren would do whatever Shay wanted her to do. An anonymous friend reported to one of the newspapers that she had bullied Lauren and that she'd bullied Lauren for her entire life. People would actually describe Lauren as being her slave. So when Lauren was in the house, she'd be making her cups of tea, she'd be putting her socks on, she'd be cleaning up after her, she'd be making her food, she'd be doing anything that Shay asked her to do, she'd be rolling her cigarettes, anything, anything. She was basically like her slave, a domestic servant. And it, it was clear that she exercised a control over Lauren. It was really obvious. To the outside, to their other friends, it was obvious. And this had also been backed up by two occasions where Shay was actually violent towards Lauren. So she's carrying that violence right through all the way from childhood to where she is now in her kind of semi early to mid twenties. So she lives with Lauren and she actually calls Lauren, she nicknames Lauren Chucky after that murderous doll, you know, the sadistic doll who like stabs everyone to death basically. I don't know how, cause he's about two foot, but he somehow manages to do it in every single movie. But um, yeah, he's kind of freaky, he's kind of creepy. So she nicknames Lauren Chucky. And I think Lauren is quite vulnerable because she doesn't actually really have any other friends. So for Lauren, Shay's her only friend. So I think that's why she probably put up with a lot of the abuse really that she, um, you know, being her slave and forcing her to do things. She just put up with it. She did it because she wanted to keep her friend. Shay knew this. So she knew she was able to manipulate and coerce Lauren because she knew Lauren had nowhere else to go. So Shay would make it seem like she was the only one there for Lauren. And indeed she probably was and she was toxic person to be the only person there for her but you know poor Lauren she didn't really know what else was going on she had nobody else so that's what she chose. Now she would often manipulate Lauren in some pretty extreme ways. She told Lauren that she had cancer and in telling her that she had cancer she would then use that as an excuse to ask for money for various things like appointments and treatments and you know to have her feel pity for her and bad for her and to do things for her around the house. So that's just a, like a, a kind of a flavor of how manipulative Shay would be and the the type of tactics she would use really shamelessly to to control people to get them to do what she wanted to do at this point Shay doesn't have a job she basically just wants to be at home all the time lauren is her slave and the only thing Shay is doing for money is dealing weed so that's the only thing she's got going for herself at the minute, that bar benefits, that's her only source of income. So now Shay was actually describing herself as a goth. So she kind of completely changed. She was always a little bit weird, but now it was like full blown. Like she would say, yeah, I'm a goth. This is like my style now. And the things she would wear would be a lot more extreme and makeup would be a lot more goth-like, you know, like corsets and red and blacks and ribbons and ties and all that sort of stuff. She also became quite a obsessed with BDSM style interactions. So for example, fake or a PE scenarios and consensual violence during SEX. And she also became somewhat obsessed with lethal weapons like knives and guns and things like that. So now, instead of just carrying a knife around with her, she actually had multiple weapons. She used to bring a flick knife in the heel of her boot. So she used to carry that around everywhere. She also had two axes in her bedroom and she had that Celtic dagger that I was talking about earlier. And she would often keep that under her pillow in her bedroom. She also had another friend called Vicky Bishop. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. So she basically had these two friends and that was it. That's all she really interacted with aside from various men in terms of women. They were like her two female best friends essentially. And I use the term best friends loosely. It's clear she was manipulating Lauren and using her. So the three of these girls, Lauren, Vicky and Shay would often go out um, on nights out together. 
There was one particular night they went out in early February of last year, so February of 2022. And it was this night where Shay met a guy called Frankie Fitzgerald. These two met in a pub in Cosham. Frankie was 25 at the time. Frankie was born to Barry and Roseanne Fitzgerald and came from a very big family. They were really close knit and they seemed to get on quite well and they all loved and cared for each other deeply. Frankie had an honest job as a plumber. Frankie's family described him as a kind and beautiful person. Frankie also had two children of his own. Frankie Fitzgerald himself was no angel. So I'm fully aware that he's the victim in this case. And I don't mean any disrespect to a victim, but I think it's important to relay the information factually. I've noticed a lot of other YouTube channels kind of painted him as if he's some sort of angel and would never get into a fight, didn't start a fight. The information that I've read from court documents doesn't necessarily paint that picture. And by no means does anything of what I've read mean that he deserves what happens to him. He does not, and there's absolutely no excuse for it. Frankie Fitzgerald was a troubled young man. He had a gambling addiction and he would often borrow money from friends and family to try to fuel this. He was actually a violent man. He had previous convictions for domestic abuse. So he had been physically violent with his previous girlfriend, the mother of his two children, and he was convicted for that. He also himself admitted to Shay that he could be violent. So, you know, videos saying that he, uh, some of them say it was impossible to start an argument with him. Obviously that's not true. And I think by portraying an image of someone as a complete angel, it does a disservice to the victims of his crimes. And that's not fair. The relationship developed really quickly. It was very, very intense. And the two, you could say, fell in love. It was extremely passionate and very fiery as well. So the couple actually shared a joint interest in BDSM and kind of violence during SEX, quite spicy in that regard, but there were times when it went a little bit too far. The couple were obsessed with each other and they would spend a lot of their time hanging out in Shay's house and especially in her bedroom. I wonder why. As well as being into BDSM, they were also into something called knife play. So pretending to like stab someone or putting the knife near someone's throat in the middle of SEX, all of that sort of stuff. So they were quite matched in that regard. But it wasn't long before Shay was up to her old tricks again. So it was around this time that she had actually also lied to Frankie and told him that she had cancer. And again, she used this as a means to get pity, attention, money. And of course, Frankie believed this because why wouldn't he believe this? Who would make something like that up? So it's just yet again, another example of how manipulative Shay can be and the lengths she'll go to, to get her way as bad as lying about something as serious as having cancer. After about a month of Shay and Frankie going out, it became clear that some things weren't going as well as either of them hoped. They were starting to have arguments. One night in particular was quite bad on the 12th of March, 2022, where Frankie and Shay were both drinking alcohol and consuming white powder, if you know what I mean. Shay didn't actually want to do it because she had stopped since the birth of her daughter, but Frankie was encouraging her to take more. And this actually led to Shay self-harming again on her thighs. At this point, Frankie became frustrated and kind of annoyed that they weren't mutually happy together and almost kind of like Shay's um, emotions were getting in the way. And then to make the situation worse, one of Shay's ex-boyfriends texted her and Frankie seen this and he became enraged. He was very angry, bearing in mind he had consumed alcohol and you know, the white stuff. So he became very controlling and possessive and he wouldn't actually let Shay leave her bedroom. He started kicking items in the room. And this has actually all been captured on CCTV because weirdly, Shay had CCTV in her bedroom and in other areas in the house, like the kitchen and the sitting room. It's not actually clear I can't find anywhere why she set this up, but I don't know, who knows, but it was there, which is kind of, um, even in itself, that's a very strange, it's quite an invasive thing to come into someone's home and think that you're being recorded, especially in the bedroom. As you can imagine, much of the CCTV in her room where it was recorded, they recorded a lot of their SEX and all of their BDSM endeavors. 
but also just daily life in the kitchen and living room, which again, weird, but okay. The couple at this point were looking for ways to spice the relationship up even more so, which was kind of crazy because they'd only been going out about a month and they both seem pretty um, intense as it is, but they wanted more. So they actually created an SEX contract and they signed it in front of Vicky Baitup, one of Shay's friends. And the contract said that Frankie was able to wake Shay up by SEX at any point and that she would agree it would be consensual. So that's what happened. The next month, Shay wrote a letter to Frankie saying that she was going to commit suicide. And um, this was untrue because she would actually use the same lie on her own dad and on Lauren multiple times, but again, probably cry for attention. So her friend Vicky at this time would say that their relationship was getting really rocky between Frankie and Shay and that Shay Shay had actually started to use the white stuff way more. So that's obviously never going to end well, but it was quite a toxic relationship because in April, Frankie himself also started to massively increase in jealousy and possessiveness. He was threatening towards Shay and he did try to control her. There's no doubt of that. But as we all know from the little snippets that we know of Shay, she doesn't seem like a person that would be easily controlled. So Frankie would actually go on to become somewhat obsessed with one of Shay's previous boyfriends called Declan Payne. He was extremely jealous of Declan Payne. So Declan and Shay used to live together for a time and they seem to be still friends and possibly still maybe a little bit of feelings there but Frankie didn't ever have evidence to back this up he just kind of felt it and then he would um, try to control Shay by just being super jealous super possessive wants to look through her phone all the time so the couple would often actually break up and get back together and break up and get back together it was just a bit of a mess at this point and remember this is only what a couple of months after them going out and even when they broke up they would still continue to have SEX and uh, it would still continue to be recorded. But she had a plan for these recordings and it was quite manipulative. She would actually say to Frankie that she would use these recordings as a means to blackmail him and release them on social media to say that he had RAPE her so she could edit them in a way, because remember they're into BDSM and they're into fake RAPE, so she could edit them in a way where it actually looked like he was or A-P-I-N-G her. And she would actually hold this uh, over him, you know, as a means to control him. So it was a bit of a, it was a back and forth. He was trying to control her. She was trying to control him. Clearly a very toxic relationship. They should never have been together. And then you're throwing in the white stuff. You're throwing in alcohol. You're throwing in the green stuff. Although that's probably gonna make everyone chill out, but still, <laughs> it's just not a good mix. So now it brings us to about three months after they met, so May 2022, and she's often getting quite abusive messages from Frankie. So he would call her an F-A-S-U-L-T, he'd call her a W-H-O-R-E, and he would make her address him in certain ways in the text messages. And a lot of the time, these would all have like a sexual basis too. But some of the messages were very threatening. So these would be about um, Shay getting with previous partners and what Frankie would do to her if he found out that she was doing that. So one in particular said that he would snap her in half if he found out she was with someone else. He also said he would stamp on whoever she was with and he assured her that cancer would be the last of her worries. Bear in mind, he thinks the cancer's real at this point, but of course the cancer thing is a lie. So it's just this crazy, you know, whirlwind of like manipulation from both sides and just toxicity, it's mad. So Shay actually shared some of these messages with Vicky and Vicky was like, whoa, that's, that's really extreme. And she would actually say that's like a threat and a half. You need to be really careful. So she would also share some of this with Lauren too so both girls in a sense were in the know of how bad it was between them and there was actually times where both girls really feared for Shay's safety they were genuinely concerned for her safety we really do have to take everything she says with a pinch of salt unless there's actual evidence to back it up so whether the girls maybe witness something themselves some of the altercations or whether it's captured on the CCTV camera in the house so in that same month eerily at one point, Shay and Frankie had SEX. So remember, they're getting back together. They're, they're off, they're on, they're off, they're on. But they're continuing to have SEX threat. 
And um, Frankie realizes that the dagger, that Celtic dagger is under her pillow. And he actually said, are you intending to stab me in the throat with it? And she, of course, said no. And that the dagger was there just for safety purposes, just that it was accessible if she needed protection. That's a quite ominous prediction by him. And remember, everything at this point is still being recorded in the bedroom. So all of the BDSM stuff and even the stuff that does go too far. So it's important to say that although they had, um, you know, sexual relationships, there was also a lot of evidence that Frankie actually went beyond what was consensual, even in that BDSM kind of vibe. Um, he went beyond it and it would have actually been deemed a serious sexual assault on a couple of occasions. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite complicated and it doesn't sound very pleasant. And often the things that Shay would not consent to, that Frankie would do anyway, she would bring this up and say, oh, you know, this is how much I love you. That's why I let you do that, even though I didn't want to do it, I didn't consent to it, but that's just to prove how much I love you. So as the months passed, now we're in June and July kind of time. At this point, both people in the relationship, so Shay and Frankie, are both literally fanning the fires of each other. So they're both super jealous, they're both super controlling, they're both super possessive. When he would come over to the house, they would initially just, boom, sit down and look at each other's phones. That's how crazy it was. That's what they would expect to do every time they seen each other, which is just like, what is the point? After a few months, if you can't trust someone, what are you doing? Like, why are you together? So yeah, it was it was intense. Sieving through their phones to find something, like they wanted to find something, both of them, to start some sort of argument. Because Shay had actually become obsessed at this point by the fact that she thought Frankie didn't love her anymore and that he wanted to get back with his ex, which is the mother of his two children. So I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what Shay thought and she became obsessed with it. And equally, Frankie became obsessed with her previous partners specifically Declan Payne. So same kind of thing happening on both sides. One night, Shay, Vicky and Lauren actually went out for the night. So they went out clubbing and Shay was talking to Frankie, but he actually became convinced that Shay had gone around to Declan Payne, her ex's house, and then he had blocked her. But there was no talking to Frankie at this point. That's what he thought was true. And equally, Shay actually thought that Frankie had given her it's technically not an STI, but that he'd given her um, a yeast infection or thrush. And she thought that he had gave that to her because he'd been sleeping with his ex-partner and that's how she would contracted it. Shay also became concerned around this time that she accepted a friend request on Snapchat and she was worried that it was actually Frankie pretending to be someone to kind of um, set up a trap for her to fall into. So it just sounds like complete mind fuckery at this point. It was around this time that she started making threats to seriously harm Frankie to other people. Now, it's not clear that she wanted it to lead to his death. It's just clear that she wanted him to be harmed. And she would often discuss this with Vicky. Now, Vicky didn't really take this serious, to be honest. She just kind of thought, oh, whatever, you know, it's just Shay. But Vicky was actually more concerned that Shay would be hurt by Frankie because, you know, she's just this little woman and Frankie's obviously a man. So that's that's where Vicky was coming from. And during these conversations with Vicky, Vicky would actually plead for her to leave Frankie. She would beg her, like, you need to leave him. This isn't safe. But equally, Shay was just as bad. So she had actually started to Facebook stalk Frankie's ex and she actually went to her house. So she turned up at her house and she brought some of Frankie's clothes and things like that and she threw it at the front door. She initially planned to catch Frankie at her ex's house, but that didn't happen. He wasn't there. Um, and she was also very drunk. So she caused a, a bit of a scene and I'm sure it was quite embarrassing for all the people that were there to witness it. But interestingly, she went there with Ashley Wingham, which is the father of her daughter. So that's kind of strange but it shows that she's obviously still, um, she still has a strong bond to him. Fair enough, you can cooperate well and have a relationship, but if you're calling them to help you with domestic disputes, it obviously means that there's a closer bond than 
than possibly there should be if you're in a relationship with someone else. So now we've gotten to the middle of June and Shay at this point had actually slept with her ex, Declan Payne, but Frankie was completely unaware. Her relationship with Frankie at this point was going from bad to worse. It was terrible. It was dangerous, it was toxic, they just shouldn't be together. And weirdly, when she had slept with Declan, she also filmed that on the CCTV in her bedroom. So yeah, kind of weird, but there you go. And on the same day that she cheated on Frankie with Declan, she also slept with Frankie later that day. So she slept with Declan in the morning and then Frankie later in the evening. And she actually accused Frankie of putting a knife in her back and obliterating her love for him. And, you know, just basically saying she, never, she didn't, he didn't love her anymore and all this sort of stuff. But ironically, she had actually slept with someone literally earlier that day in the same bed. So from then on, Shay actually kept her relationship with Frankie going and she also kept seeing Declan Payne again. So this was a bit mental. She would have like a, almost like a cat and mouse that they would actually be in the house, in her house at the same time. And her, Vicky and Lauren would have a WhatsApp group where they would talk about, you know, how to keep them um, separate. So how to keep Frankie in one room and Declan in another room to make sure they didn't meet. And they would like text in this group and it would kind of be like a joke almost, which is actually really ridiculous that they're playing with two people's lives like that, that are both completely unaware of each other's presence. But again, this just goes to show how manipulative Shay was. I think it's fair to say most people wouldn't have the nerve or the you know, the lack of empathy or remorse to be able to have two partners in a house at the same time and you're just going from one to the other. That like, and just the balls, I think that like, that takes a lot of nerve to be able to do that. Because if they had met, the girls would often say in the WhatsApp group, if they do meet each other in the house, like they're all dead, they're dead. There would have been a massive blow up. So yeah, it was, a, it was a really, really big risk to take, especially knowing how jealous Frankie was. If he had seen her ex in the same house as him, it would have, oh my God, it would have been crazy. So it seems that she had no problem juggling different partners at once. Maybe Frankie could kind of sense this in a way because he, around this time, started becoming really like depressed, really bleak, really down, really dark. And he would often send Shay messages like rejecting her and rejecting women in general. But he continued to be absolutely, insanely jealous of Declan Payne, not knowing that he was actually seeing Shay at the same time and he was in the same house as him a lot of the time. It also became clear around this time that Frankie wasn't the only person to have been threatened by Shay Shay and her video footage of them engaging in BDSM and that she would make it look like RAPE. She'd actually also threatened previous partners with this exact same thing, which to me is insane that Declan actually wanted to get back with her after that, but I don't know. So Frankie probably, it just got too much for him at this point and he actually requested for the CCTV in the bedroom to be taken down and Shay agreed. So there was no more CCTV in the bedroom at this point. He obviously just did not feel comfortable with it being there anymore. On July 4th, Shay recorded herself in the kitchen having a conversation with, with Vicky. And this conversation involved Shay saying that she was going to get some of her male friends to beat up Frankie. So she wanted to get him seriously hurt. And Vicky wasn't sure if she was being real or not. She thought it was kind of like half serious, half joking, but Shay was being completely serious. However, her plot just sounded kind of ridiculous, like something out of a crime fiction novel. But the worrying thing is that the intent was there. So she still believed, even though she was cheating on Frankie, that Frankie was also cheating on her with her ex, which hasn't never been verified. So because of that, she wants him beaten up, even though she's doing the same thing as she's accusing him of, but okay. It was around this time that the serious sexual assaults that I talked about previously by Frankie was actually done to Shay. So I won't go into detail about what they are, but it sounds very painful and she did not consent to it, or at least she says she did not consent to it. But uh, the reason why this is believed that she didn't consent is because there was footage of her talking to her friends, talking to Vicky and Lauren, which didn't seem scripted um, and that she was saying that she, you know, that he had done this to her. And that's another reason why she wanted him to be seriously hurt. And this is a little bit of a curveball, but around the same time, Shay's daughter is now five and exposed to this 
a fucking horrible environment of a house, it, something inappropriate happened with Shay's daughter, who's five, and Vicky's seven-year-old son. They both had hoped that this inappropriate contact was completely innocent, but Vicky did actually call social services to tell them. So at least that's something. I can't find out what actually happened with that or if it went anywhere, but it's still very strange as to why a five and seven-year-old was left alone unsupervised. Yeah, it just seems a bit odd. Total curveball, but that's part of the story, I guess. So now on the 14th of July, there was a very big argument. Frankie and Shay were both drinking and the argument just completely blew up because Frankie found something on Shay's phone. I'm not sure what it was, but he went through the contents, found something, was incredibly angry and told Shay that he was going to hurt her physically. So the CCTV of this the next morning was recorded when she was telling Vicky and Shay this in her kitchen. So Shay said to them, and again, this is her account because remember there's no CCTV in the bedroom at this point. So whether you wanna believe that, might need to take it with a pinch of salt, that he became violent and enraged and he started kicking the bookcases in her room and kicking furniture. And she described him as being a jealous, petulant child, which is kind of ironic. And the same evening when she was giving him a something job, Frankie had actually said the name of his ex. Now, to me, it seems so obvious that he'd done this on purpose because he'd went through her phone and seen something that he didn't like, obviously. And then he happens to do this later that day. To me, it seems obvious that that was done intentionally because he knew that would rile Shay up. And of course it did. She completely flipped out and went into a jealous rage. So on the next day, the 15th of July, Frankie actually missed his job as a plumber. So he didn't go in that day. And in the filmed footage in the kitchen, so on the CCTV there, we can see Shay talking to Vicky again. So this time, you know, Vicky's saying, look, your life is a complete mess. You need to sort yourself out. And she was also saying how alarmed she was for Shay's safety at this point. Again, pleading with her, please break up with him. This is just, this is not working. And Shay said to her, don't worry, I've got weapons. I can use them on Frankie if I need to. She also told Vicky that she actually warned Frankie, I will put the knife into you if I need to. And she said she would have no problem doing a long stretch. So that's quite scary, the fact that she actually said that to Frankie and then to Vicky the next morning. So the next day rocks around, it's 16th of July, Frankie comes over in the evening and straight off the bat, first thing, they both give each other their phones and they're both looking through their phones meticulously. I mean, at what point do you just think, what even is this relationship, if that's what you want to call it? I don't understand. <laughs> I don't understand. There's obviously zero trust, but that didn't stop the pair consuming alcohol and taking the white stuff, which they did. They weren't incapacitated, but they did take a lot. Um, her daughter wasn't there at the time. She was actually at her dad's house. But still, you know, there's no way that in all of the times they drank and took the white stuff that every single time she was at her dad's house, for sure her child would have been in the house um, during a lot of the times that, that they were partying. At this point, Shay is still messaging Declan, but she's deleting all the messages. So she's still being quite affectionate with Declan, but deleting the messages. So Frankie, you know, doesn't see these. But he sees on her Snapchat, like, uh, I don't know, I think like most, um, what is it, most sent to people or whatever it is in Snapchat, he sees that one of them is Declan and he completely freaks out. And Shay was worried enough in terms of how Frankie would react to contact Vicky and Lauren, warning them that potentially a dangerous confrontation might happen. So a fight ensued. They were, you know, shouting at each other, being abusive towards each other. But at this point, the CCTV isn't in the, the bedroom anymore. And the, the couple kind of gets separated at some point. So uh, Shay's upstairs in the bedroom and Frankie is downstairs. And the fight seems to have kind of hampered down a little bit. And Shay is calling Frankie to come upstairs to go to bed because at this point it's the middle of the night and Frankie's like yeah yeah I will in a while I will in a while but Shay in the meantime is upstairs looking through Frankie's phone and she actually sees that he was talking to a girl on Facebook Messenger and the girl said that she was 13. So she has seen this and completely freaked out. She screenshot the page and sent it to herself. It's, it's actually unclear whether at the time she realized that Frankie had actually blocked this 13 year old. 
So in reality, this 13 year old was actually 17. What they basically think is what happened is that Shay seen and became enraged that it was a 13 year old, you know, and then got really angry about it. But I think even if she knew that he had blocked her, I think even just the interaction of him talking with another person the age of it aside. Um, that's just my opinion though. So eventually Frankie came upstairs and he went to sleep. But little did he know what Shay had planned for him. So completely riddled with jealousy and rage after seeing these Facebook messages, Shay took the knife from underneath her pillow, that Celtic dagger, and with a blow that used moderate force, she slit his throat. So he actually had a massive gouge, so much so that the back of his throat was actually open internally. The left internal jugular vein was completely severed and the left carotid artery was partially severed, which would have caused momentous bleeding and quite a sudden death. However, even after this, so that alone was fatal, Shay then went on to stab him 19 times in the chest. So in total, there was 22 stab wounds which is so horrific, considering after the first one, when she slit his throat, he obviously would have woken up in complete shock, complete horror, gasping for breath, not knowing what was happening, and then to continue stabbing him in the chest. So after this, because remember, if she's severed the arteries that she severed, there will be blood everywhere. All the blood in your body will eventually come out quite quickly. So the duvet was completely saturated and she'd actually put bin bags underneath the duvet as well in an attempt to try to kind of hamper some of the bleeding. Following the stabbing, Shay had actually messaged Vicky telling her that Frankie had left the house because they'd had a big argument and that it was completely done forever. So she was trying to set the groundwork for an alibi. Even Vicky would go on to say that these text messages that she'd sent in the middle of the night were clearly an attempt at Shay for trying to sort out some sort of alibi. So at this point, it's actually the early hours of the morning, so it's around half seven or so, and she calls Vicky. So when she called Vicky, she seemed giddy and she's just chatting as if normal, normal chit chat, until Shay kind of shifted tone in the conversation, shifted mood and said, oh, there's something I have to tell you. There's something I have to show you. You know, promise me you won't tell anyone this. And Vicky was like, yeah, okay. And then she turned the phone and actually showed Vicky Frankie's dead body. And she went and zoomed up close to the gash in his throat multiple times. And Vicky was so shocked by this. At first she thought it was a joke. You know, she thought, oh, you know, she's a dark sense of humor, this can't be real until she actually realized it was real. And Shay started speaking about how she was gonna cover up the body. Shay would tell Vicky, I just lost it, I just lost it. I picked up my dagger and stabbed him in the neck. I've done him. Shay would then try to say that she had done it in self-defense because Frankie had been or A-P-I-N-G her. And then she went on to send Vicky some of these videos. However, she had actually edited some of the videos, the CCTV in the bedroom, when the CCTV was there, she had edited some of those BDSM videos to make it seem like he was or P-I-N-G her. But in reality, the full version of these clips actually show it was completely consensual. So there's her manipulation again. Even up until this point, she's still trying to convince people of whatever story she had going on in her mind that she wanted to portray as the truth. So Vicky, you know, taken back by this, was asking her questions, also kind of being like, why? Why did you do it? And she would say to Vicky, oh, I did it because um, I was looking at his phone and he was messaging a 13 year old girl. Vicky was like, okay. And then Shay also said that he woke up and tried to fight back, but this actually has been disproven because he has absolutely no defensive injuries whatsoever. And she told Vicky at this point that there was so much blood everywhere. Shay also made it clear that she was going to try to make the death of Frankie look like he'd committed suicide because obviously he'd been in such a dark place in the last month or so and she thought that would probably be a good cover up. Now Vicky would actually go on to say that she thought that Shay got a thrill from this violence that kind of um, conflictingly that she she thought that she was actually madly in love with Frankie but also the thrill of the violence kind of um, counteracted her love for him. During the conversation that they had, Shay would also go on to say that she was going to bury him in her back garden. And when Vicky said, look, you're, you're obviously going to get caught, this is insane. Shay's response was just, eh, he'll be all right. 
Like she didn't really care. I remember Lauren lives in the house too. So it wasn't long before Lauren woke up and was like, what the hell is happening? Um, and of course Shay told her and because Shay can control and manipulate her so well, she wasn't really that worried about Lauren telling anyone or saying anything. She had actually convinced Lauren to help her put the bin bags underneath Frankie's body. So she started then saying to her that she was an accomplice and that she basically had to help her now. Otherwise she'd be going to jail for a very long time. It's also clear that she rang Ashley Wingman at this time as well. So in the morning after she had stabbed Frankie, there's no CCTV of this, but there's phone records of them speaking. And it is presumed that he and her spoke about how to, you know, cover up the body, how to hide the body, what to do, except this was completely denied by Ashley. Shay goes along with this, that they never spoke about the body, but I find that very hard to believe. So it was actually Vicky that alerted the police, but she didn't actually alert the police until four hours after the phone call, which I think is fucking ridiculous but at least someone rang the police came to the house and shay acted so blasé about the whole thing as if you know she didn't really know what was going on and acted like almost surprised that they were there but really kind of cool calm and collected considering there was literally a dead body upstairs in her bedroom of a person a partner that she had murdered no 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 don't close the door what's going on what's going on you shay I am Shay. Right. I had some kind of strange, interesting call about somebody having had their throat slit. Okay. So what's going on here? No, that's, that a dog, that's is it? my dogs, yeah. Hello. You're under arrest just, on suspicion of murder. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention when questioned, something which you later rely on in court, anything you do say may be given evidence. The necessity for your arrest is for a prompt and effective investigation. She didn't even really try to deny that she was the perpetrator. She didn't, she just didn't care. Even with cleaning up the body, you know, it was kind of like a half-hearted job. The smell of bleach was everywhere when the police came. It was really obvious what was happening. At this point, Shay were arrested on suspicion of murder. And what will probably be the only sign of remorse from Shay was that once she was arrested, she was seen by a mental health nurse. And she had said to the nurse that she didn't deserve a blanket in her cell because she had taken a man's life and what she did was inhumane. But that's literally probably the only smidge of remorse. If it was genuine, probably not, but who knows. She was then interviewed by police numerous times over the next few days. In the first two interviews, she responded to everything with no comment. In the third interview, she started to form a web of lies about self-defense. But it was clear that no one was actually believe in this, nobody. So eventually the case went to trial and it was a five week long trial at Winchester Crown Court. So Shay rocks up to court wearing a jacket with a pentagram on the back of it and basically remained expressionless throughout the whole trial. And you know, if you want to wear a jacket with a pentagram, cool. But if you're going to go to court where literally 12 people are going to be judging you, <laughs> like at least pretend to you know, I, although maybe it's a good thing that she actually doesn't even have the like wherewithal to be able to pretend or to be able to infer, I need to look like the best possible version of me. It was very clear in this court case that the judge seen right through everything that Shay was trying to portray. He did acknowledge that Frankie obviously was a violent man and there was evidence of that and that the two of them were in a very toxic relationship. Both of them were controlling and jealous and possessive and they shouldn't have been together. But an interesting argument from the prosecution was that she had gotten the idea basically to kill and to clean up the crime scene and to try to create the alibi from all of the true crime, her obsessions with true crime, so her books, her documentaries, entries, her pictures, all of that sort of stuff. So they went down that road. Honestly, I think that that's uh, like letting her get away with it lightly and trying to take away some of the responsibility. I think it's fair to say in terms of cleaning a body and all of that sort of stuff, if you've learned how to do that from documentaries and crime scenes, there's no way you're going to be able to do that like to the degree of competency that would be needed to actually cover up a crime. Like you'd need specific chemicals and specific cleaning devices. It's just, it's so like dumb to think in this day and age with how like sophisticated technology is that you would actually be able to cover up a crime that gruesome as well and um, that messy, you know? So yeah, that's probably a good thing though that she probably believed that she could do that. 
you know, that was her downfall in the end, which is quite good. <laughs> but she did actually, she did admit guilt, but she admitted it with diminished responsibility. And she tried to carry on with her self-defense story and that she picked up what she thought was a money box and hit Frankie with it in the throat. And oh, oh no, it happened to be a dagger. So yeah, the dagger was under her pillow. A money box obviously wouldn't be under your pillow. And it's also like square or rectangular. Um, I'm not really sure how you could mistake a dagger for, you know, a rectangular box but there you go. The judge thought that it was a crime of passion. He believed that she wasn't a cold-blooded killer because he thought that she did genuinely love Frankie, but um, I'm a bit skeptical about that. Can love really exist when there's that much level of control and jealousy? I'm not sure. Uh, that's what he believed, so... The jurors also found her guilty unanimously and she got sentenced to 23 years in jail. Shay actually smiled throughout the reading of the entire verdict. Another little attempt at trying to reduce her sentence, and I'm not buying it for a second, was that once the jury went out for deliberation, she actually wrote a letter to the judge. And in this letter, she apologized for what she'd done. She apologized to Frankie's family. And, you know, the judge was kind of taken aback by this because she seemed so emotionless throughout the whole trial. And now all of a sudden she's apologizing. You know, it just didn't seem, um, it didn't seem genuine. And the judge luckily just seen right through this. And, you know, he thought, oh, it's kind of convenient that you, now you're saying sorry right before the jury are going to come back with a verdict. During the sentence hearing, Frankie's dad read out a statement about Frankie. He said, I'm still grieving. I'm not sure I will ever get over this. Today, I would say to Frankie, I love you, son. You are missed by everyone. Your shining light will always be in our hearts. Although Frankie was no angel himself, he definitely did not deserve his life to end in this way. And it's clear that he did make a mark on a lot of people and that he did seem to be very loved and cared for. Woo, that is another one done. Okay, well, thank you if you've made it to the end. The Irish coffee definitely helped. And uh, yeah, please do subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you so much for watching and I shall see you in the next one.